Hi, I'm Bill Hodges, and this is Spotlight on Government. And today, what we have is not really a government agency or even government, but it is adjunct to government and a very strong asset to the Tampa and to the whole area of the Bay. And what we want you to do is to meet our guest, Julian McKenzie, President and CEO of MOSI. Thank you very much. Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, yes, sir. You know, I'm going to tell you this right off the bat because we talked about it off the air. I went there about, oh, five years ago, six years ago, and they asked me would I come out and look at it, and maybe have them on the program. And I went out and looked at it, and it was awful. Oh, you... it, it was dirty, and the, the displays were poorly kept. There's all kind of things going on. But that was yesterday. That was five years ago. And since November 18th, when we reopened to the public in a smaller footprint with uh, a lot of very interactive exhibits, every exhibit functioning. And that has been something that I have been very, very focused on, is the quality of the exhibits and the fact that they should all be functioning when the guest is on site. We've got nowhere to go now but to grow, exactly. right? Exactly. We have plenty of space to grow in. Well, we've kept our building down. We've moved into the smaller building. We closed the old building because it was obsolete. But it's still there. It's still there. It's, the county is deciding what they're going to do with it. But we wanted to make sure that we had something manageable, smaller, that you could feel the excitement in it. And You know, in talking with you and the folks that came along with you, I feel that excitement. Oh, you, you need to come and visit. and everyone I'm needs going to. to. My, my wife and I, Phyllis, we'll come out and we'll have a look at it. Yes. And you'll see that there is exhibits re regarding moon base, um, the space station, life feed from the space station. We've got an art gallery. So we've moved to steam as well. We have a resident artist painting in the exhibit space and people interacting with him. And once a day he does a very exciting thing is he pulls out a whiteboard, gets all the kids around and draws on the whiteboard what they want to see. Oh, cool. And they, you know, they'll ask him for a, an alligator with a giraffe's head with a <laughs> pig's ears and things like that. Um, so, you know, this is Autism Awareness Month. We have pictures hanging, paintings hanging on the wall in the art gallery of people with autism. Uh, we've just opened a new exhibit called Be the Astronaut, where they can learn how to fly, navigate, plan uh, a mission in simulators. Now that sounds interesting to me. Oh, that is... It's I don't think I'll ever become an astronaut, no, but, but I, I think it'd be a fun thing. Oh, that is a very, very fun thing. You know, I've spent some hours on it, I have to admit, and I've got a real kick out of doing it. We've also gone and refurbished the planetarium completely. So it now has a full dome projector in it where you can not only see the stars, and we show the stars as that they would be seen at night here in Tampa if there was no light pollution, but we can also project very interesting films about missions to Mars and the new challenges that have been put out there to get back to the moon. You know, I really like the planetariums. That, that's got to be one of my favorite things because I think probably one of the earliest things that man ever did was learn the stars. Absolutely. You know, we, it's our a connection to the, to the earliest things of man. Yes, and we have a, a very good planetarium system. It's the Kronos. So we can position the sky from anywhere in the planet. And we use that also as an education. You know, what's the North Star? Why is it called a North Star? And we teach the visitor who's observed, uh, attending the session, what, where the um, stars are positioned and why they are, you know, the... Why Orion's belt is his belt. Yeah, and things like that. So I, I think that would be one of the fascinating things for me, is to be able to go in there and sit back and look up and see these stars and think, you know, these are the same stars that ancient man saw. Yep, and use them to navigate around yes. the world. We've also brought in a... Uh, what we call the makerspace idea zone, where they can build robots. And in fact, that reminds, oh, really? and that reminds me, uh, I was at the University of Tampa Fellows Forum a few weeks ago, and there was, amongst the speakers, was the CEO of Tech Data, which is a huge company in this area. Uh -huh. And he was explaining how important science education is, and that they had gone and got 150 13-year-old girls in to... Um, look at their technology and one of the girls um, 
so went up to him and said, sir, you know, this is very interesting, but it's not as cool as at Mosey, because there they build, we can build robots. <laughs> so, you but know. you made a statement, and I think it was very, very interesting, is that by the ninth grade, many children have completely lost interest in science. Unfortunately, that is a national statistic, and it's higher in certain areas than others. And this is where I want to see Mosey, and I believe Mosey's mission is to try and move that needle. And we want to do this by going into the classrooms, taking the education into the classrooms to help the teachers deliver the science education. Uh, it's getting very difficult for school groups. We do have school groups coming to Mosey, but it's very difficult for schools to get the kids onto buses, get them here, and spend enough time to really benefit. Make it them, worthwhile, yeah. To benefit from their experience. So we are working very hard on developing a really reinforced uh, outreach program called Mosey in Motion, which involves us getting some nine vans and us going to the schools to deliver the science education. Oh man, that would be great. And I think... By then you encourage them to come back to yes. the facility. Yes. And I think that by us getting uh, into the schools, um, we will be able to educate the demystify science education really i think that's the objective for us well, the zoo's been doing this for years well the they send out a, a band with somebody with a raccoon and a snake and a couple other things to get the kids excited to come out to the zoo well we do that in part already but we don't we're only impacting about twenty four thousand kids in a year what we want to do is take it to two hundred and twenty thousand kids and that's what, a three county area? That's a nine county area. Nine county area. Um, and we really want to make sure that, you know, people in DeSoto uh, County, Hardy County, they just can't make it to Mosey and back in a day. Whereas we can go there and spend two or three days there, you know, teaching science. A any thought of having any overnight trips to Mosey? We do that already. We do have you? some, yes, we have sleep. See, I'm always a day late and a dollar short. <laughs> we have sleep ins, camp ins. Okay. Um, Kids come in and spend the night at Mosey, and you know. I think if somebody had a birthday party, that would be so cool. Oh, they do as well. We do. Really? Do, yes, we do do birthday parties at Mosey and uh, the camp ins. The kids love it. Uh, it's a chance, you know. It gives a whole new meaning to, uh, to that film, a night at the museum. Oh yes. Yeah. Do you so, have wild things running around at night, besides the kids? Um, <laughs> robots every so often. <laughs> <laughs> but otherwise, no, you know, it's fairly, it's fairly well controlled and No stegosaurus running up and no, down the hall or no, anything? No, nothing like that. <laughs> you might get a robot or Moonbase Mike walking around. Moonbase Mike is our astronaut. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. And, and we use him a lot in, uh, in events. We used him during uh, the uh, Gasparilla Children's Parade. And he was walking along our float, alongside our float. And the kids love it and you know want to take selfies with him and everything and he's got mosey written all over himself in his <laughs> little, space. little advertising there right why not it's all it worth. should be you know it, it's fun to see a facility like this come to life it's, and I'm, I'm sorry like i said five six years ago when i visited i just was not impressed but i'm going now oh you must i, I will go because the excitement that you and the folks you brought with you have it displayed across the table. And you know, probably one of the interesting things is your background. Yes. You came from Europe. I came from Europe about eight People years. People are going to be wondering at the accents. We might as well get that mm. on the plate. Well, um, I'm British. I came from Europe uh, about eight years ago uh, to lead and restructure a medical device company. Um, then that, I moved on from that. Uh, went into doing some financial consultancy work because my background initially was in finance. And through that, I was asked if I would join Mosey as CFO in October of 2016. And I decided that I would take the challenge on because I wanted to give something back to the community. And that enabled me then in March, I was asked if I would take the presidency, the lead, become CEO when my predecessor resigned. And through my financial background, I was able to see that we had to do something significant because we were very close to you know, shutting the place down forever. The guy in the checkbook that's looking at that checkbook knows more about a facility than just about anybody else. Yeah. And having you step up from that checkbook role 
to the leadership role, you can watch the checkbook still because you get the financial background. Yes. And you really do need people to step up and help, correct? Correct. We have a staff, we went from 65 people to 25 employees. We have a staff of very committed people, of people who really want to make a difference, of people who are there because they want to be there. I and bet you the one that took me on the tour is gone. <laughs> probably. <laughs> but we have people who, you know, there's no, during this whole reconfiguration, we were closed for 12 weeks in 2017, there isn't one employee who did not move, paint, demolish, build, connect, and exhibit. So they got sweat equity in the house. Yes. And that's important. Oh, it's very important. Because, because it's a sense of ownership of the people that work there. Yes. And we have a team that is, we're smaller now, but we're a lot more nimble. We can adjust to whatever the circumstances are much faster. It's a much flatter organization. And, you know, I have the director of education, for example. I've seen her walking around with a broom because something had been spilled or needed cleaning. Yeah, you know, th th that is so important. I was at Costco the other day, and there was a piece of paper on the floor. I, I couldn't get it, but this lady, who's one of their executives, was walking across, and she bent down and picked up the paper and threw it away. And I said, that's very nice of you. She says, why wouldn't I? It's my house. Yeah, well, that's the way. And I think you're saying this is what these people are now feeling. This is their house. Yes. And we, they want you to come and visit it. We all, it's been part of the change in the culture of the organization. And we all want to make sure that this is transmitted to everyone who comes in, that they see that the staff are passionate about what we're doing there. What about corporate support? Do you get much corporate we support? Do, have or some do you need corporate support? Are you looking for corporate support? We are looking for corporate support because we want to, as I mentioned, really launch this outreach program. Um, you know, some schools can't afford us going out there, so we have to have the support to fund the trip, the costs of us going into a school. We have to buy the vans. Um, so we are looking for support. You know, yes, we have a very sustainable uh, business plan as it is today, but if we want to go to where I think Mosey needs to go, then we're going to need corporate support. I think it'd be nice if some of these people had a van in their name. Yeah, well, that's exactly the idea that we want. With some advertising on it, the yes. kid, they care about kids. You know, the other thing I've noticed is that there are several cities that I fly into that as you walk through the airport, they have these little windows or areas in which they have technology companies who put their product up for people to see. It would seem to me this would be a great way to show off well, we have, Tampa and the technology companies. And we've got a lot of them. We do, and we do have some of that already ongoing at Mosey. We have a local company that is probably one of the world's leaders in drones. So we have a drone exhibit. Oh, cool. That I want to see that. And uh, the drone exhibit teaches them the history of photography, the history of aviation, and how it married into um, the drones. Wow. Uh, autonomous vehicles, same thing. And we actually have our own autonomous vehicle. And a little known fact is that Mosey was, had the autonomous vehicle even before Google. And we have one that is a static display at the museum, and we have a second one that we are reconditioning. And we're going to use it in our outreach programs and so that we can then show people what autonomy means in that sense. You know, Julian, the, the thing that, when you mentioned that, Phyllis and I, on the drive into the station today, we bought the very first 2018 Honda Accord that was delivered to Tampa and got it at uh, Brandon Honda. And it's got so many self-driving things on it that it, just blew me away. Oh yes. For a while, I kind of like, but now I like it a bunch, and I'm thinking the older I get, the more autonomous the vehicle <laughs> can be. I just want to get in, sit in the back seat, and say, "Take me to Mosey." Exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's so we really putting an emphasis on new technologies at Mosey. We have, um, as you know, the Mission Moon Base completely refurbished. Uh, Tell us what we'd see if we went in there to the Mission Moon Base. What, what you'd, you'd, as a family, what might we do? You would come in, you have a one minute film of leaving the Earth, landing on the moon, and then you would walk in and it's a simulated moon base. So, mineral, mineral collection, they can, the visitor can drive rovers, they can do some. Really? Uh, yes. 
Um, they can now, do. Is there an extra charge for? Not for Mission Moon Base. No, moon Base. Oh, that's all part that's of the. That's part initiative. of the. Yes. Um, they can do soil sampling. There is an aquaculture exhibit part of that, that where they learn how to uh, tr grow fish on the moon. Um, there is cool. an agriculture part of it. Um, there is, you know, energy production. Um, how a qu sleeping quarters for someone living on the moon, what they could look like. And there is a simulated lunar surface at, as they leave the exhibit where you can actually see the Earth or you know, an image of the Earth and the sky. And a lot of people enjoy that. And you find people there taking pictures of themselves with the Earth behind them. You know, I, I never thought about it, whether the moon had or did not have a gravitation. So I'm assuming that the moon does have some kind it, of gravitation because I'm, I'm picturing the astronaut standing there holding the flag. Yeah, it does have um, gravity. It's about six times less than it is on the okay. Earth. What we have, what's been discovered since is that the moon has ice, therefore water in the... The moon, I heard, I heard about Mars. I didn't know about... The moon as well, wow. in some of the darker areas. And so it is, has the capacity of producing water. Wow, I did not know that. Mars, they just released. Yeah that they, under the surface, there was water. Yeah, well, in some of the craters that are not lit up by the sun, they have found uh, traces of ice. What's the, te do you have any idea what the temperature on the moon, I'm asking a financial guy, but since you're talking about moon base, what the temperature on the moon? It is? varies. Um, the I guess it would depend on whether it's facing the, the sun, right? Yes, but um, it gets very, very cold. I think with minus two, 300 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. That's cold. My wife would be cold at 70, so I don't think it's a good thing. Yeah. So when people come as a family, there are things for the whole family to do on moon base. Absolutely. The whole family, there's people, things for people to do. A whole family can be entertained and educated throughout the museum. Some at, things are at age what age, you know, I see people taking children to Disney World when they're two and three, and I'm thinking, eh. But what age would be the best age to start bringing your children to Mosi? I think about five years old. About five? Four or five years old. Okay. Um, our sweet spot is probably in the 10 to 13 age group. That's where we really, you know, they can really okay. benefit from it. But, you know, five, they can do it very nicely as well without any issue. Besides the moon base, what other things would people do when they came there? Well, we have the wind tunnel. We have... Um, wind tunnel, what is that? That is a simulated wind uh, hurricane. So it, uh, it blows air through this tunnel and you stand in it up to 70 miles an hour. Um, it's we, not one of those where I fly, right? No. no. Not supposed to anyway. No. Uh, we have the um, Tesla coil where they can put their hand in and put it up against in a metal uh, sleeve and it goes up against uh, an electrode and that produces energy. Um, the whirly birds, where they can build, uh, cut some strips of paper into the shape of a helicopter, and they can fly them. Really? Yeah. Uh, and then we have all the mind, um, the medical area, where they can play. We have an exhibit that measures mind uh, brain waves. Oh, really? And they can, the most relaxed person. That'd be a little scary if you found out you didn't have any. <laughs> well, it measures the brain waves and pushes the ball to the woods, the, uh, away from the person who's the most relaxed. Really? Yes. So if two or three people are around it, the ball would go to the most relaxed person? To two people, they put a little band around their okay. head. And two people, it will push the ball um, away from the person who is most relaxed into the goal of the person who is least relaxed. You're kidding me. No, it works. Works very well. But the ball is going into the it's the person the who's one. most relaxed is pushing the ball into the goal of the Most ball. relaxed? Yes. Really? Yes. I would have thought, it'd, for some reason, I'm thinking it'd be the other way around. No, no, well, it measures... Uh, the brain it, waves, when you're really upset, would seem to be... Exactly. So, therefore, it measures, it, it measures the brain waves, and the person with the steadiest brain wave um, wins. I'll be darned. We also have an exhibit that shows and teaches them what, about drinking and driving through goggles, very special goggles that we get them to put on. Oh, I think that's, that should be everywhere. That should be one of the things you take out and show the kids. <laughs> and uh, it's actually, that one is uh, quite difficult because it's, it's a very, very good exhibit. Do you have to drink in order to, to no, no, do no, it? No, 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 it's an optical illusion that we 
put on them. Okay, so it'd be it'd be an AI of some kind or another. And it's a pair of goggles that you put on, and the goggles have uh, some plastic in it that changes the image, and so it simulates someone being under the influence of alcohol. Under the influence. So it'd be like if I was looking through it, it'd be now you're sober. Now here's what it looked like if you've had a drink yeah. or two and so oh, forth. Yes. We have a mobile version of that as well that we take out. That would be something I would think that teachers would appreciate. And I know as a parent, uh, I would have appreciated it. Maybe as an adult, <laughs> <laughs> before I quit drinking, that would have been a good thing too. Yeah. But we, you know, so we have a lot of things for all ages. We have an area where they can build robots. Um, they can see the person painting. Talking about the kind with the wheels and yeah, go yeah. around. And we stuff. have a little robot that can resolve Ru Rubik cubes for you in 60 seconds. Really? Yes. And the kids are taught how to program it. And so we're doing a lot of things in robotics and you know travel to into space and things like that and the art gallery and everything. So it's you know very very exciting, concentrated interactive exhibit for everyone. Put you on the spot a little bit. When is it open? Mosey is open every day of the week okay. from 10 to 5 every day. Well, that was easy. I thought it was throwing you a hard one. I thought it would be so much on this day, so much on no, that no, no, one. No. We keep it simple. So it's not open in the evenings at all? Not for the time being, no. Okay. But we are, you know, we went through this whole reconfiguration process, mm -hmm. which we started on um, August 13th. Uh, and actually, actually, if I have one regret, it's I should have waited a week because then the eclipse came by. Oh, yes. And we had over 5,000 people. Fowler Avenue was completely gridlocked. Uh, we had coaches coming along and buses, you know, opening their doors and a bus full of people would come into the parking lot. Wow. And it was quite an impressive thing. But, it, you know, everyone has their uh, eclipse story. But this is the one that I most enjoy is a lady went up to one of my colleagues and said, you know, there's a lot of people here. I'm very worried about the number of people here. Can you start the eclipse any earlier? <laughs> so, Have you got a prayer mat? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but anyway, so we started, you know, we went through this whole um, reconfiguration process and we wanted to make sure it was working and we've now got it working we uh, want to make sure that we are really financially sustainable and then we'll go back to doing things like Einstein on wine which used to be something Mosey did a few years ago where you know kind of do evening events for adults but you know let's crawl walk and then run oh yes it's important you know and that's I think the most important thing is keeping it financially sustainable yeah because if you don't do that, things start to slide. Exactly. And you, you've watched that happen. <laughs> yes. And, you know, when I joined um, in October of 2016, Mosey, unfortunately, for the financial year of 2016, posted a $1.4 million loss. We were able to turn that around and for the financial year uh, 2017, posted a $90,000 surplus. And this year, you know, we're trending with a nice, comfortable surplus which is important because that will reassure the, in, the donors and the corporate donors who look at this as an investment and look at it being an institution that is viable, that they can count on and that will, you know, they can support and will also promote their brand or whatever it is they're wanting to promote. Yeah, you made a statement earlier. You were talking about it and you were saying that in the past they tried to run it as a business. Well, in the past... A profit-making business, let's put it that way. Yeah. And that it was important to understand that this is a public service and that breaking even is a good thing. Well, I think, peop you know, this is a business. Um, you know, we, yes, we do have the not-for-profit status, but not-for-profit doesn't mean for loss either. No, that's exactly um, what you said. And we need to be mindful that, yes, we are giving, delivering a public service, but we have to be profitable at the end of the day. As now, I'm not saying that we're going to be so that we're going to be able to reinvest in what we're doing. You know, when when you start talk about profits, you're not talking about dispersing them to 
huge CEO yeah. salaries that don't know what yours is, but I don't imagine it's huge. No, it isn't. <laughs> and, or is it in paying off a bunch of stockholders big dividends? What you're going to have to do is to have enough money made in order to continue the strength of the organization and to expand its value to the organization, correct? Correct, absolutely correct. And you know, a successful institution like Mosey is an enormous asset to the community. Mosey's been around since 1962. In its history, we've had over 16 million people visit Mosey. Um, we've had some huge blockbuster traveling exhibits such as Bodies, where we had 620,000 people come in. But it's important you know, that we continue in this being a successful organization that can deliver quality education to the community. Well, Phyllis and I both, my wife Phyllis Hodges, and I both love museums. And we love interactive museums. And when we travel from city to city, as I was explaining to you, uh, in, in Columbus, Ohio, there's a great program up there. It's got a beautiful thing. I think they call it Cozy. Yes. And then in Toronto, Ontario, on, on Don Mills Parkway, there is a fabulous facility. So it's not only just locals. It's people like myself who like to go and learn about a community yeah. who mm -hmm. you serve. And I think that's important to understand. We have a lot of tourists come into this town, and many of them say, what do we do when we get here? Unfortunately, that is true. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that, and this is one of the reasons, you know, why we are thinking about moving downtown in about five years' time, um, is so that we can better serve also the tourist community coming to us. We, but at the same time, you know, our local community is fundamental to us, and delivering our outreach programs through Mosey in Motion, uh, having an interactive institution is very important. We're now looking at further enhancing the institution by bringing in some augmented reality, some virtual reality exhibits where people, you know, with their cell phone can learn more by pointing it at, a, at an exhibit and getting more information from about what they're looking at or interact with the exhibit. We, we really want to make it a very, very exciting place for people to come into. I understand moving to downtown to be around the tourists and things of that nature, but downtown Tampa today, and I'm sorry, I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I don't even want to drive down there. And they're talking about putting in a sports stadium to make 275 its total parking lot instead of just a part of it. And they adding these things, unless we get some boat traffic that can maybe it can be somewhere close enough to the water where we can maybe have a boat traffic into it that people can come and visit it in many different ways. Well, you know, the decision to move downtown was a decision that preceded me. Yes, um, yes, it did. So... I want to make sure that we have a very strong asset to move down there at the right time. Um, I think you know it is going to possibly cause issues with with these uh, traffic, but you know I think that those will be resolved in due course. Julian, will you come back and give us progress reports? With pleasure, with great pleasure. I'm Julian McKenzie, CEO of Mosey. I am so happy that you came in here today and. I'll take you up on that offer. Phyllis With and I, will, within the next month, we'll give you a call and we'll come out and see the facility. And then the next time you come on, I can talk about how great it is. Because I know if you're doing it, it's going to be. Absolutely. I thank you for coming on thank the show. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm Bill Hodges. This is Spotlight on Government. Thank you for being with us. You're unique, you're special, you're great. Tell yourself so often because you are, you know. And we'll see you on the next Spotlight on Government.